One of the most challenging conversations to have or concepts to explain, questions to answer as a parent to young children is where do people go when they die? What happens to people when they die? And I think that the reason that is really challenging for us is that I'm not sure that many adults actually know. We have some idea. We have some thoughts and some opinions. But we find it challenging to put those into really concrete answers and explanations. Um, I would assume that if we were to go around and just ask a basic question, you know, and you might hear this question from either your children or a family member or a co-worker who uh, maybe doesn't go to church or whatever, they might say, hey, you know, as Christians, what do you believe? What happens to a person? Where do they go when they die? Most everybody in here would likely say something to the effect of, well, we believe that a person goes to either heaven or hell. Now, the latter part of that uh, answer is a different discussion for a, another day, perhaps a, an entire uh, new series, because it, like heaven, is filled with misconceptions, false assumptions, and, and opinions that may or may not be based on Scripture, and we could have that discussion later. But for the past, uh, past few weeks, we've been talking about heaven and particularly about what does the Bible actually say about heaven? What kind of descriptions does it give us about that place? And I'm sure that you've picked up on the fact of, I've been using a few terms like present heaven, intermediate heaven. I've introduced to you the concept of a new and future heaven, new and future earth. And that might be, uh, depending on the depth of your study or familiarity with the Bible, a new concept or new ideas, and, and I hope to get into those even further next week. Today, I want to focus more on uh, what the Bible has to say in the idea of the present heaven. And that refers to the heaven that currently exists... And the heaven that has existed since the time God created it. And now even that statement for some of you is wildly new. You might be thinking, wait a minute. You mean God created heaven? The current heaven? Well, yeah, how else would it exist? Right? I, I said last week, we talked about the nature of God some, and, and I want us to remember that only God alone is eternal, meaning He has no beginning or end. God alone is self-existent, meaning He needs nothing or no one else in order to exist, including heaven. God doesn't need heaven as a place to hang out. And to be God. He simply is. So there was a time in history past that God created heaven. In fact, that's how the Bible starts, right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I explained to you last week that that term in the Hebrew, heavens, is a term that could refer to the sky, it could refer to the cosmos, the universe, or it could refer to as what we call the abode or the dwelling place of God. It just depends on the context, how you're using the word. It's a word that in Hebrew is always plural. The Hebrews always stated when they spoke of heaven, whichever one they might be describing as heavens. You're like, that's a little odd. Why would, why would you refer to something that might be singular in nature in a plural fashion. Well, we do it. Some of you are wearing uh, on your face these things that help you see. What are those called? Glasses, not glass. They're made of glass, perhaps, but they're called glasses. You only have one pair. It'd be really odd if you wore two. But there's two components to it. Depends on if you're talking about the right side or the left side. We have words that are always plural. If you went to the mall you know, over the weekend to buy some new clothes... Right? You didn't go and buy a new cloth. 
You went perhaps and bought a new pair of pants, not a pair of pant. So languages have these types of words that are always, and so it just depends on the context in the Bible uh, as to what heaven or heavens is being spoken of. But here's the thing uh, where we want to begin our focus today is that there was a time, Genesis 1-1 tells us that there was a time when just like the present earth, the one we're inhabiting right now, there was a time when it did not exist. So just like that, there was also a time when the present heaven did not exist until God created it. That also leads me to believe, and since John saw this in Revelation 21, he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That tells me that just like there was a time in the past where it didn't exist, there will be a time in the future when this earth and the present heaven will not exist, at least in their current state. So what is the Bible teaching us about the present heaven? Write this down as your first point. begins with a T and ends with temporary. Say it with me. The present heaven is temporary. temporary. How do we know that? Well, because Jesus told us. Listen to what he said in Matthew 24, verse 35. Jesus said, heaven and earth, the present, heaven and earth, will pass away. But my words will never pass away. You'll notice he repeated to a phrase, pass away. The word that Jesus used that we translate pass away can mean exactly the way we mean it when we use it which means to perish. When we talk about someone having died and we want to sort of soften it, you know, ease the tension a little bit and be a little more sensitive, we say, so-and-so passed away. What does that mean? Well, in the context of time, it means that their life expired. It came to an end. And that is exactly what the term Jesus used means, to go past or to go beyond. In reference to time, it refers to an action that continues for a set time. After that time, it no longer continues. It's like when you get in your inbox an email that offers you coupons or a discount code. You might even get those still in the mail. Um, usually every few weeks or so, you'll get a booklet of them for Hardee's here in Locust, which no longer exists, <laughs> right? Those are no longer of any use. But anyway, somewhere on the coupon or in the email with the discount codes, there will be a date. And it will say something to the effect that after this date, this is no longer useful. This coupon or this discount code expires on a certain date or at a certain time. That's what Jesus was communicating to us about the present heaven. In the beginning, God created it, but it only exists, it is only useful in its current state for a particular time. And at the end of that time, it will expire. It will pass. Things will change. Now, given the nature of the present heaven is temporary, Theologians will refer to that and refer to the present heaven as the intermediate heaven. That term means in between or transitional. Again, it invokes the idea that it is temporary. So, when we say so-and-so died or passed away and went to heaven, or we might refer to ourselves, we're explaining to, again, our children and saying, you know, when we die... We go to heaven. Is that inaccurate? No. Is it wrong? No. It's just not complete. It's not really clear. It's not a full explanation of what happens. Now, if we're talking to an eight-year-old, it's totally sufficient. Because that's about all they're going to be able to understand. But if we want to have a more in-depth, a more informed conversation about what happens when a believer in Christ dies, we might want to adopt a definition like this. When a follower of Jesus 
dies or passes away, he or she enters an intermediate state in the intermediate or temporary present heaven. He or she then awaits physical bodily resurrection and ultimate relocation to what in the future will be a new heaven and a new earth. And now some of your brains just went, what? I get it. It's still sort of early in the morning. And that's a lot to take in. That's a lot to really wrap your mind around. But that's what the Bible describes for us. So I want you to, to just stick with me. So at a basic level, yes, if you're a Christian, if you've given your heart to Christ, if you trusted him as your Lord and Savior, then when you die, you go to heaven. That is biblical. However, just understand that the heaven you arrive in will not always be in the same condition nor in the same location as it is right now. Again, that's what the Bible says. And I get it that that raises a lot of questions, a lot of what ifs, and what about this, and what about that. Some of those questions I'm not going to be able to answer for several reasons. One, don't have time. We've allotted seven weeks for this series. We could spend many more weeks than seven talking about what the Bible has to say about heaven and entertaining different uh, questions. I've encouraged you to pick up two books. One called Heaven by Randy Alcorn. Two, The Real Heaven, What the Bible Has to Say by Chip Ingram. Those are great. They would, they would be awesome assets and helpful resources for you as you continue your own study. Now, the other reason I might not be able to answer your question comes down to intelligence. Either A, I'm just not smart enough, or B, I don't have the information. Right? You hear people talking about, well, we got intelligence on such and such. In other words, we acquired information. Well, the information that you seek might not actually be in the Bible. Maybe God doesn't speak to that particular question, and so I can't answer it. It doesn't stop us from at least entertaining it and having a discussion about it. But here's the thing. What we can know, and I think what we can arrive at when it comes to the present heaven, is that it's temporary. We might follow that with this question, but is it real? In other words, is it tangible? Is it actually a physical place with physical attributes? Is it a place that we might perhaps even inhabit with physical bodies well let's look at what the bible has to say number two i think it teaches us that the present heaven though temporary is also tangible went into depth a little bit in in this last week so i don't want to re-preach last week's message but the reason i keep coming back to it the reason i keep mentioning this is because i don't want us to fall into um, the idea, allow ourselves to be led to believe that when we die, we go to some intangible spiritual realm. Because I don't think that, that that is the way the Bible describes heaven at all. That we enter into some disembodied spirit realm where you sort of ambiently float around until such a time as a new heaven and a new earth. And so you might be thinking, well, Pastor... So you're, what you're trying to tell me is when we die, we enter into the present heaven, which is a physical, literal place, and that we might even possibly have some sort of physical body? That's exactly what I'm saying. Now, am I going to be able to give you all the details? Probably not. But there are a few things, I think, that the Scripture says that might at least open the door to these concepts. Let's deal with them separately. One, about the present heaven being a literal, physical, tangible place. You see, ideas other than that are typically, this is how we arrive at something different, are typically based upon things that we've just been taught in the past, that we have assumed are true. It doesn't mean that pastors, teachers, and churches of our past where we grew up or, or whatever have intentionally misled us, but perhaps they have unintentionally misinformed us. So maybe that's where these ideas come from that 
that heaven is just some sort of spiritual disembodied realm. Or it could be we've been watching too many movies. Too many TV shows about what the world thinks heaven is like. And that's why sort of all these disembodied spirits just sort of float around. There are some people who just believe that it just can't be. That heaven cannot be a physical, tangible place. That is a place that engages your senses. Sight, smell, hearing, touch, taste. All of those things. Why not? Well, there are some who would say, well, I don't think that that, that heaven can be a physical place because in their mind, it somehow cheapens it. It makes it less special. It's not as sacred or holy if it's actually physical in some way. It has to be more spiritual. See, those ideas really, they may not realize it, are rooted in an old philosophy called Gnosticism. Based upon many of the philosophies and teachings of Plato that pretty much suggest, and this is a basic understanding, that anything of matter, anything of the material world, is inferior to that of the spiritual world, and even goes so far as to suggest that anything of matter of the material world is evil. So how could heaven... The place the Bible describes as being the dwelling place of God be physical and tangible because it would be inferior. And then they would say, well, and God, God is spirit. My response to that would be, what's that got to do with it? Well, sure, God is spirit. You remember the conversation that Jesus had with the, the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, verse 24. He said, after a discussion of you know, where a person is supposed to worship, he said, uh, ma'am, understand that God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God can dwell wherever. He can be worshipped anywhere and everywhere. So him being spirit has no bearing on whether or not heaven is spiritual or heaven is physical. Remember, they are not the same thing. God doesn't need heaven in order to exist. He created it and chose to dwell there. They are not the same. However, what we do have is throughout Scripture instances and examples where God, a spirit, dwelled in a physical location. Throughout the Old Testament, where we read about God taking up residence, dwelling among His people, there between the cherubim in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle and later on in the temple. That was a physical place, was it not? He chose to dwell there, a spirit in a physical place. He would choose from time to time to meet with Moses and speak to him on a physical mountain. He instructed Moses to go back to Egypt to lead his people out of slavery from a physical bush. You remember that? So is it difficult for God, a spirit, to dwell in a physical, literal location? Well, no, because he's God. Now, we could go on and on, but I I just ask you to entertain this question. If one day, the Bible teaches that one day all believers will inhabit a physical new heaven, new earth, is it so far beyond the realm of possibility to believe that perhaps God could and perhaps even does provide a literal and physical intermediate in-between place? Would that be too much for God? Absolutely not. We could go on and on and on. Let me give you a couple scriptures here uh, to consider on the matter of the present heaven being tangible, being a real place. One, Exodus chapter 25, uh, Moses is given instructions for the pattern of the tabernacle. 
And when he's given these instructions in Exodus 25, verse 40, God says to him, See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, my first question is, where did the pattern come from? Patterns are made after something, right? Where is that something? Hebrews 8 tells us exactly where that is and what that something is. Hebrews chapter 8 begins by contrasting the ministry of Jesus, our great high priest, with that of the Old Testament priests. And the person explains that the, the, the Old Testament priests, they served in a tabernacle or a temple made by man, whereas Christ, verse 2 of Hebrews 8, serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord. Verse 5, they, the priests, serve at a sanctuary, listen to how he describes it, that is a copy and a shadow. Now you might can make a copy of something that's not tangible, but you can't make a shadow of something that's not Right? For something to cast a shadow, it has to be real. You have, to, you have to be able to touch it. And so the writer here says that they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is, where is it? In heaven. So there's something real, there's something tangible in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, listen, it just all sounds to me to be very real, very physical, that the earthly temple, the earthly tabernacle was a replica, a shadow of what was physically located in heaven. For some, that's not going to be enough. I understand that. I'm not saying that I'm the end all. I'm just, just taking you to the Scripture and suggesting that this is this is one way to think about it. Now, if you want to go further, think about the vision of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. He was given a glimpse into heaven. Well, which heaven? Well, the present heaven. What did he see? He said he saw God, who again is a spirit, but certainly can manifest himself in a visible way. He said he saw God, he saw the train of his robe, and it filled what? The temple. Well, Hebrews chapter 8 just said that temple, it, it seems to suggest that it's real, right? The train of his robe filled the temple. And then he heard voices that were so powerful that they shook the doorposts of the temple. And he said, and I saw this angel, and the angel went to the altar, and from that altar picked a live coal. Not a coal that looks live or that resembles a lot, but picked a live coal from the altar with tongs. Can I ever touch my lips with it? Again, all of that sounds very literal to me. What about Stephen in Acts chapter 7? Stephen is literally being stoned to death because of his faith in Christ. And right before he dies, again, curtain is drawn back and he is given a glimpse into heaven well what did Stephen see Acts chapter 7 verse 56 Stephen said look I see heaven open so I'm getting a vision a gateway into a place I see heaven open and the son of man who is that Jesus the son of man standing at the right hand of God now let me ask you something did he see a physical Jesus did Jesus physically rise from the dead? Well, certainly, that is a foundational Christian belief. Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and physically, bodily, rose from the dead. And then in Acts chapter 1, that same physical Jesus ascended into heaven. Heaven. Stephen, Stephen says, I see him, a physical bodily Jesus, and what's he doing? Standing at the right hand of God. If he's standing, what can we assume he was doing right before he stood? 
What are you doing? Sitting. What was he sitting on? Well, maybe a throne. Given that he's God, perhaps a throne. Would a non would would, would a physical Jesus sit on a non physical throne? I mean, he could. Why? Because he's God. But it wouldn't make much sense, would it? I see Jesus, the Son of Man, standing. Huh. I wonder what a physical Jesus would stand on. Because you can't stand without standing on something, right? You're physical. He's physical. Now again, could a physical Jesus being God stand on nothingness? Yes, he could. But why? So again, this is just to get us thinking that perhaps this is an explanation, a possibility. And then you have John in the book of Revelation. John, like Isaiah, like Stephen, is given a glimpse into heaven. Well, what did he see? Did he see anything much different than the others? No. You begin reading in Revelation chapter 4. John says, I saw a throne. I saw someone sitting on that throne. I saw physical beings. I saw people that he described as elders who were clothed in robes. He saw multitudes of people. They were singing. They were chanting to the Lord. Some were waving palm branches. There's all kinds of descriptions that he gives us that seem to be very physical. Were all of them mirages? Were they holograms? Again, disembodied spirits? I mean, you could possibly make the argument, but I'm convinced they're tangible. I'm convinced they're real. I mean, what about those people that he saw that looked as if they had bodies? Well, can you really call them people? Humans? If they don't have bodies? Think about that. Has there ever been a time in history that a human being existed without a body? No. We did not exist before Genesis 1-1 as some types of spirits that were then given a body. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 describe God creating something very unique when he created human beings. Very unique. Angels were created spirit beings who had no bodies. Animals are created beings who have bodies and have no spirits. But the human being is in a category all its own. We are just as much physical as we are spiritual, spiritual as we are physical. God created a man, a body, from the dust of the earth and then breathed life into him. So if John saw people with bodies, could you really call it bodies without an actual body? Could you call them people? Again, just for discussion. But it suggests to me the possibility that when we inhabit a tangible but temporary heaven, that God could offer us a tangible and still yet temporary physical body. Let me, let me say one more thing about this. This is just, just to create in your mind, you know, or to bring that from or away from the realm of impossibility. Are there any people in heaven right now that we know of who have physical bodies? And I know you're thinking about grandparents and, you know, and you don't know. But from Scripture, is there anybody? Don't be afraid. Say it. Anybody in heaven right now who has a physical body? Jesus. Okay, one. We've got one. Jesus rose from the dead physically. He's in heaven, ascended there, Acts chapter 1. Okay, so then the possibility is there. If there's one, there could be others. What about Enoch? 
What about Enoch? In Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, it says that Enoch walked with God and then he was no more because God took him. So perhaps Enoch is there with a physical body. What about Elijah? The prophet Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. He hands over the ministry of the prophet to Elisha. And then, whoo, this whirlwind takes him into where? Into heaven. So now we have at least three people that we know of who are in heaven right now who have physical bodies. Tell me there couldn't be more. Tell me that God, who can do anything, could not provide you, me, grandma, grandpa with some sort of intermediate temporary state of a body until or while we await physical bodily resurrection. I'm mean, just saying, it's possible. You're probably wondering, like, all kinds of questions. What about this? What about what? I don't know. I don't even understand what you just said. What you, I have no idea. What will that body be like? I don't know. I can't really explain it. And here's why. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. I didn't put it on the screen for you, but write this down. John said, Dear friends, we are now children of God, and what we will be. You get that? What we will be at some point in the future. Has not been made known. But we know this, that when he, when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I don't know exactly what that body will be like if it exists, because it's not been made known. I do know this, that for the time being, this one ain't going. Listen, I've done a lot of funerals over the last 20 plus, 30 years, whatever, I've never seen a body go anywhere except the ground or through the process of cremation. However, the, the Bible does say that one day, one day in the future, this body will go. But even then, it won't be the same. It's going to be different. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Starting in verse 51, he says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. You should underline that word. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. He's introducing the concept of a rapture. That there is coming a time when perhaps God will take more. Just like he took Enoch, just like he took Elijah. God will take others. Without the traditional physical death experienced here on earth. That aside, he said, verse 52, In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. Remember what that word means? You know, that will not pass away, will not expire, and we will be changed. So we won't be the same. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. So on this discussion about whether or not we have intermediate physical bodies in the present heaven, is it still open for more discussion and debate? Well, certainly. Sure it is. And we can have all the discussion we want. At the end of that discussion, at the end of the debate, will we come to a definitive conclusion about what is and what is not? No. How do I know? Well, because as long as we're here on this earth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, will apply. Listen, I tell you a... Mystery. There's some things we're just not going to know until we arrive. Now, before we go, I want to add one more adjective to this list of things or ways the Bible describes the, the present heaven. I think it's apparent from what we've seen in Scripture that the present heaven is, is temporary. It, it, it's a real literal place. Yeah, we can debate it. But I think the Scripture suggests that it's a real literal, tangible place, whether it's located in some other uh, universe somewhere or beside ours in another dimension. And from time to time, like Isaiah, like John, like Stephen, God sort of pulls back the curtain and lets us get a glimpse into it. I, I don't know. 
But here's what I can say. I'm certain of this, that the present heaven is thrilling. It might be temporary. It may be tangible, may be intangible. It really doesn't matter to me one way or the other. It doesn't diminish it whatsoever to me. It doesn't lessen my desire and anticipation to go there. It's no less exciting to think about heaven while we debate these things on earth. I understand that you know, we're using our imagination and, and, and the present heaven, what we're going to do there and, and what it's going to be like may not be exactly the way I imagine it. And even if I'm correct, it may not always be the same because the Bible says that that, that order of things is going to pass. Something new, something different is coming. Again, those realities don't diminish heaven in my heart and mind. I think about it like this. You, you can relate to this, I'm sure. There are a lot of people in heaven right now that I know. Man, people that I love. People that I miss. There are people there that, man, I can't wait. I can't wait to see them again. And, you know, tell my granddaddy, I love you, man. I've missed you. It's so good to see you. You know, catch up on old times. Talk about all the things I, I wish he would have had time to teach me that I'm too stupid to figure out myself. I've tried woodworking. He was a master at it. I just can't do it. My, my Mimi. You know what I'm saying? People I love. And, and I get it. Even saying those things probably creates questions. Pastor, you think we're going to know each other in heaven? You think we're going to recognize each other in heaven? Well, listen. I'm not going to give you the answer to those questions right yet. I want you to come back because we're going to talk about it. Y'all have noticed every week we've been trying to like reel you back. Right? <laughs> just give you a little, a little taste. Just come on back. And, and here in a few weeks, I want to talk about what does the Bible say or what, what could we conclude when it comes to topics about life, love, leisure, and heaven. And I'm talking about whether present heaven, future heaven, does the Bible give us any, any indication on those things, what we're going to actually do, what life will actually be like in heaven, what relationships will be like in heaven? I think the Bible does give us an indication. Next week, I'm going to move our topic from the present heaven, the temporary one, to the eternal heaven, what John describes as a new heaven and new earth. Let's let's investigate as to what the Bible says about that. And then I'll go into the topics of life, love, and leisure. Let's just leave it at this. It's going to be awesome. Heaven is going to be a thrill. I understand life here can be tough. It can be painful. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of troubles and, and trappings. There are plenty of times in this life where, where we experience uh, low times and struggles. But I think we still have to admit, it's pretty good. Right? I mean, despite all of those things, life here as it is, is, is still, it's not that bad. So imagine how great it's going to be, how exciting it's going to be, how fulfilling it's going to be when one day all of the temptations, all of the trappings, all of the troubles that we know are realities right now are removed. Man, that's going to be exciting. That's a place that I want to go. Just imagine it. And you say, oh, I can't. I can't imagine it. Why not? Maybe it's because you have nothing to base your imagination on. 
I hope that this series sparks your interest, drives you to the Word of God to find out more about what He says about heaven. Other people might say, well, I don't think we should go imagining things. Let's not go using our imagination, you know. Why? Why? Are you afraid of something? Are you afraid that you might imagine something being one way and then arriving there and it being totally different? So what? So what if you imagined it being one way and then discover that it was another? So long as your imagination isn't based on something that contradicts the Scripture, is there any harm? Now, if that happens to be the case, change your imagination. Conform to what the Word of God actually says. Otherwise, if the Bible doesn't speak to it, use the imagination. Why, why am I not afraid to say that? Because God gave it to you. God gave you your imagination. One theologian put it this way. To imagine heaven doesn't imply that heaven is fictional. It doesn't cheapen it. It doesn't lessen it in any way. Rather, it affirms the critical role of the God-given human capacity to construct and to enter into mental pictures of divine realities based upon that which is mediated by the Scripture. Let me put that in layman terms. There is no harm in using your imagination, your God-given imagination, to construct mental pictures of what might be divine reality so long as those imaginations are based on the Word of God and what we do know. Understand this. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, 21, to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly beyond we could ever ask, think, or imagine. To him be the glory and honor in the church forever. Listen, there's no harm. You shouldn't be afraid to use your imagination to, to think about and to wonder about heaven. Just understand that God can do even greater things than your imagination. Isn't that fantastic? That's amazing. So let's, let's wrap things up. Paul said this, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So when a Christian dies, do they go to heaven? Yes. That's what the Bible says. There's a, there's a great discussion that we've started as to what that actually means, what that looks like. But here's what I know. As soon as you take your last breath, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as soon as you take your last breath here on this earth, the Bible says that the angels of God escort you into heaven, into his very presence. Luke chapter 16, verse 22. Read about Lazarus and the rich man. Read Psalm 91 verse 11 that says that God commands his angels to guard you and, and to, you know, to direct you in all of your ways. Let me ask you this. From here to heaven, is that a way? Is, is, that's directional, right? God gives his angels charge over us in all of our ways. And that, in that moment, when we take our last breath here, and the angels of God escort us into his very presence, yet this is just my personal take on it, my personal opinion, but I believe the first scene that we open our eyes to in heaven will be much like what John describes in Revelation 4, where he begins in verse 3, and he says, And there before me was a throne in heaven, and someone sitting on it. And the one sitting there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. He was so precious, so elegant, so magnificent. And a rainbow shone around like an emerald. It encircled the throne. And then his attention was what he heard. To the one sitting on that throne, he heard all of heaven declaring, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come to you. You alone are worthy to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things, including all of this. By your will they were created. And by your will 
they have their being. In other words, they exist. And what a magnificent image. I get it. The thrill of heaven, what it's going to be like, how exciting it's going to be, what we're going to do, what we're going to fill our time with, whether we're talking about the present heaven or the future heaven, it's hard to imagine. It's hard to grasp. But let's just put it this way. Don't let that cause you to miss it. Don't let the difficulty of grasping it cause you to miss it. With every head bowed and every eye closed. As I've said and tried to make a point every single week in this series, it's not just about learning more about heaven. Listen, you could learn all you want about heaven. You could fill your mind, be them facts or fiction about heaven. But if you die lost without Christ, you're going to miss it. You won't be there. And the only way to enter heaven, Jesus said, is through him. John 14, 6, I am the way. Not a way, not one of many ways. Not one option among others. I am the way. That means the one and only way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Where does the Father choose to dwell? Heaven. No one will enter heaven except through me. He's the only way. So if you want to enter heaven... You have to go through Jesus. His death, burial, and resurrection provided that way. He is the door. He's the gate. However you want to describe it, he's the only way in. Right now, would you express your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and trust him as your only way? God, I trust you today as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin that you were buried and rose from the dead. I believe what your word says, that with our, heart, with our mouth we confess, and with our heart we believe. And that anyone who confesses, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, that's you, Jesus, will be saved. I acknowledge you today, Lord Jesus, as the only way to enter heaven. I plead your blood over my sin, I ask you to clothe me in your righteousness because I cannot approach God in my own because I have none. So I come to you asking to receive your grace and mercy. Asking that you prepare a place in heaven for me for all eternity. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, for loving me enough to die on a cross for me and for making a way. If you're praying that prayer, something like it, to receive Christ into your life, we want to know about it. Take time to fill out the connection card that's in the back of the seat in front of you and turn that in at Connection Central right out here in the main foyer. For the rest of us, let's, uh, let's continue our thoughts and our meditation on heaven and thanking God. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to, to enter in this discussion this investigation as to what your word says about that place called heaven. Lord, open our minds perhaps to to new concepts. They're not new to you, but perhaps new to us because our old understanding and our old concepts have never been challenged by your word. And so, Lord, when when we come to that place, where what we thought was true is challenged by what is true based upon your word, I pray that there's a willingness there for us to conform what we think to what is, to conform to the truth of your word. Where your word doesn't speak, where it doesn't provide a concrete answer, Lord, would you guide our imagination based upon what you do say? Continue to keep our hope, our anticipation, and desire for heaven high until that day we see you face to face. 
In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.